everybody yo happy happy, happy there we go happy hey guys we're gonna get started with the weird how thing how loud is that ac in the background by the way i can't hear it pretty damn loud really that's fine that's fine i i, I cannot hear it yeah we well we gotta we, you're good we, we gotta gate it out you're good i'll leave it off right now but that's good to know in case it gets like super hot yeah. hey everybody hi folks welcome we're gonna do the weird things Bryce, you make it all the way through upload. I did. I did. I'm. I'm glad that I did, and I'm glad. I'm glad you you responded, and that kind of pushed me to uh, uh, to finish it. Cool. But yeah, uh, I I thought it was one of the sweeter post singularity <laughs> convert. You know, because like the things you pointed out, like this sucks. This sucks about like the world these live. Like, yes, that <laughs> they're aware, and it's, you know, they're it, it, it looks like these. Uh, God, I forget the show run. Like when the guys working the office was trying. You know, oh. he's dirt, dirt, dirt. Great. There's, between that and devs, like there's some high level thinking. Yeah, I um, I think what what got me with um, w that got me a little weird at the at the start with that was that. Uh, I I wasn't sure how wacky the world was supposed to be, um, mm -hmm. and once I got into it, and once you meet like uh, you know the quote unquote private investigator, like that was where I was like, oh, okay, <laughs> we this is goofier than than uh, than I was treating it, or I was thinking it should have been. But, no, uh, I, yeah, I I was a little bit wary and then i kind of i like i was very happy with the mod the, the amount of it wasn't like idiocracy that just was kind of almost you know critical of itself in a sense yeah. i thought sort of you know there's a lot of satire you kind of look at like well look at the crazy times we're in right now you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah you know i like like oscar meyer intel <laughs> <laughs> i didn't think it was uh I think it was very clandestine that Amazon and Zappos kind of, kind of got got missed the brunt of all of those all of those corporate merger jokes. I thought that was pretty funny. Yeah, yeah. Hello, everybody. Hey, there's Hello. Brian. Featured Yo. prominently. <laughs> so I couldn't do it. All you all you 2020 people, I can't do it. I'm I'm living that 2010 lifestyle where where you know you have ultra precise vision. Can't handle reality shows are real hot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, Obama's still yeah. president. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right, right before the, the stream went live, Brian uh, I, I was almost doing contact lenses today, but uh, yeah, but then, the, but then I couldn't. I literally go. couldn't read the screen, and so I'm like, <laughs> mm, I'm out. Hey, everybody, we're gonna start reading things here in just a minute. How's uh, how's everybody doing? Good. So, how are we feeling about our backup internet? Should we should we announce that we're doing that? Uh, no, we shouldn't. Okay. We should tell right. everybody to forget that you said that. Forget it's, that I said that. It's I didn't not. say anything. <laughs> it's not perfect. Oh, that's right. Oh, really? Yeah. Is it a bit off? It's not perfect. Hmm. Uh, but it's a thing. It's a thing. So that's that. Uh, hello, everybody. We're gonna get started here. I think I think we would describe it as a serviceable backup. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but like a camp like a camping toilet. Yeah, See, why like, you don't you... want to live. You you don't want to shit in a camping toilet all your life. But boy, how are you happy when that camping toilet's there? Now, fair enough. What what is the use case for a camping toilet? Uh, camping when you're camping. 
Okay. Or when, when, when you don't have a toilet. Yeah. See, Bryce, there's so, uh, a number uh, one and there's a number two. Yeah. And when you have a number two <laughs> and you're out in the woods, sometimes you need a camping toilet. You do normally poop in a toilet, right, Bryce? <laughs> what What I'm saying is it, part of camping and roughing it is yeah. you know going and i ain't never taking a shit in the woods uh that's that's yeah. that's a the thing. pope does uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> according oh, to the you're big too good for the, pope? Yeah, for the pope the pope's yeah. out here shitting in the woods <laughs> the poop hope coming to hbo <laughs> <laughs> it feels like i just think in this situation of i have i have bathroom needs having maybe a roll of toilet paper would be higher than camping toilet a toilet i mean why yeah. not both jesus are you yeah. like on like some uh quest that you only have so uh, many uh gold coins it just i, I spent 79 nuggets, dollars on were? this camping toilet and i'm not paying any more for toilet paper i'm sorry yeah. it just seems like it still ends up on the ground either way i don't know that is my, that's my thinking i guess it gives you somewhere to sit on i don't know hello everybody <laughs> hey <laughs> this is a we should really include that that was a good uh, intro <laughs> i like that intro that's a good one <laughs> <laughs> oh man uh all righty you guys uh want to do the thing you guys want to do the show ready to rock let's do it oh, all right then i'll count you in in three two hello and welcome to the weird things podcast i'm andrew main joined by justin robert young hey mr brian brushwood hello beautiful people and bryce castillo hey everybody that's me Gentlemen, one of the things we've talked about before is kind of our, our favorite cool secret space plane, which I'm talking about the X-37B. That's that thing that looks kind of like the mini space shuttle the Air Force uses to do kind of experimental tests. Yeah, I guess it's been up a few times, but 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 it's always been top secret stuff, so we don't really you know have much to say or or, or speculate about. Yeah, it'll go up like unannounced and then it'll stay up there for like like a year or so. And apparently what it is, I actually went to a presentation by the guy who was head of the Aerospace Corporation, which is actually this organization created by the United States government to run satellites and space ops for the Air Force. And he gave kind of a pretty neat sort of kind of overview of some of the details about it. And uh, what's uh, he was actually the liaison, I think, the, the Air Force liaison to it. But anyhow, point is, it's away from the test cool stuff. You know, they want to test different space hardware, et cetera. They put it in there, send it up. And the latest thing they apparently have been testing on it is using microwaves to beam power from up in space to Earth and perhaps ideally like drones or drones or aircraft. And if you wanted to have something go extended periods of time is, you know, if this works, if you can beam power that far from up in space into a moving target, it could have a lot of implications, obviously for the military, for being able to power drones and keep things going consistent, you know, for you know a tremendous amount of time. But when we talk about the idea of let's say building space stations and stuff, it doesn't make a lot of sense to put a bunch of solar panels in space when it's expensive to do that and maintain them when you could just put them on the ground effectively for, you know, you might need more up on the ground, et cetera. But when you're talking about building, let's say, a space platform with a bunch of solar panels that they could beam power anywhere. Flying cars, all sorts of other stuff, you know, you extend the range and the possibility of that. Man, I, I feel like we got the, the trademark Andrew Main two steps immediately forward. Uh, if we can go back two steps, we're talking about, um, so here in America, we, we could pour, power things wirelessly with microwave beams. Um, picture a coil around a magnet, basically, and you can beam a thing at it. And much like a, a an, an RFID chip or whatever, it can get some power long enough to process and go. You could get more power if you have a focused microwave beam on it, uh, which usually would be you have a power source. Let's say it's flying around America, and then it's like, uh, oh, battery low, wants to land. Then you shoot a beam at it, battery recharged. Uh, I'm I'm wireless charging just like your iPhone. That is, so, so far, I got that much right, right? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. However helpful you feel that is, yes. Okay. So, second thing is when it comes to military applications, we don't have the luxury of being able to put those recharging, beam throwing things on foreign soil. 
So instead, all of a sudden it becomes very valuable to be able to beam that microwave uh, energy from space, which is, which is uh, so, so we're talking about uh, for this, uh, 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 certainly military applications, which if, if we're now in the phase where there's a open to the public civilian application for it, I, ass I assume that, that, that the military has been doing this for a while. Well, I, this is the first time we're aware of trying to test power beaming from space. So this would be the first time I attempt to put something up into space. Power beaming, things like this, it goes, I didn't go in detail into it because we've talked about it. It's an old concept going back to Tesla and stuff. So I try not to dumb things down too much because I assume our audience is kind of up to speed on okay, some of that well, stuff. Allow me to disabuse you of that notion. I will always be so dumb that you need to, to, to uh, dumb it down that far. Yes, say that, but you don't really mean it. Um, so power beaming is a thing that, you know, the, the idea of being able to transfer power from one to another is extremely, would be very useful. There's the problems with efficiencies and stuff, but... The idea of putting, you know, power satellites up there, which, you know, is an idea we've talked about before, beaming power down from space, is one thing, but the idea to use it to power things like aircraft is a really neat application because the problem with trying to build, let's say, electric aircraft and stuff is batteries right now don't carry anywhere near enough the same amount of power as, like, jet fuel. And right. if you have a platform that is, like, you're looking at photos of drones... If you can beam power to space down to that drone, you could keep that up until the parts wear out. You could keep that forever. You know, and if you wanted to have fleets of these things flying around cities delivering packages and stuff, it stops the need for them to have to go recharge. And you start thinking about like you know shield helicarriers and stuff. And and just like with um, uh, uh, chemical propellant rockets, uh, the fuel itself tends to be the heaviest part of of, of a drone. Absolutely. Yeah. When you can get rid of those battery packs, your, your payload goes up tremendously. Uh, that's amazing, especially if what you want is either a, uh, you know, constantly running drone to supply Internet uh, or, you know, 5G or, or surveillance or, or any of that stuff. Uh, uh, all of a sudden, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And, and you think about that and then when... You know, I'm a big believer in you to think about like what's the biggest version of this. And you know, when we've talked about the idea of moving to that future of flying cars and stuff, et cetera, when you can have a flying car that sits, you know, that can sit land take off from a parking garage across the street from you and go cross country. That's an amazing idea at that point where you don't have to stop. And it could go faster and further with this kind of technology. And it's early in its infancy, but it is exciting to see this ha development happening. Keep in mind also, I guess uh, if, if what we're looking for is wireless drones that are constantly aloft, to some extent, I mean, if, if you want to emulate, you know, vultures and so on, uh, you can ride thermals up high enough, but, but at some point there's just not enough updrafts and every so often, you know, the buzzard has to flap its wings. Uh, this could provide the energy to, to cover those, those gaps in, in the opportunistic, uh, you know, uh, keeping a loft. Uh, yeah, there was a, I think there was a Facebook project, which was trying to do like really high altitude gliders. So solar powered. With that, but it's that, that easier. And, you know, you look at like, uh, you know, an example right now, SpaceX is launching their Starlink for satellite internet. The problem with satellite internet is that it's not really good for highly dense areas because it's like millions of uh, we, you can start putting Andrew, okay. we, 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 keep, we keep losing our connection to you. Um, if, if we can kind of hold off for a sec. Justin, are, are you having connection issues? We can No. No, I mean, I, I can I can see Brian uh, 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 moving. It was just Andrew that was slowing down. Okay. Um, do, do you, is there, do, can you take a check and just make sure you don't have anything running, Andrew? That might be eating up bandwidth. Keep an eye out on our side. Just shut everything else down. Yeah, right there we got we got some stuttering, and that was on the uh, on the on the voice line too. So that's that's two independent. Internet sources on our end. Yeah. I did think it was, uh, man, that, that's actually an interesting possible upside to the, uh, to the backup situation is that we, we can know, I mean, if it's happening on two totally separate independent 
internet connections, then that gives us a clue that it's probably not on our end. Mm. Uh, we have, now we, we are... He's probably disconnected, so I think he's going <clears> to... <throat> assuming he's going to go maybe restart his router. So we'll give him a, a couple of minutes here. Cool. Cool. Uh, 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 uh. Oh, wait, no. Oh, he's back. Teleported uh, back. Andrew, if you can hear us, we cannot hear you. I think he missed. What do you mean? Yeah. Tech problems. Everybody's working. Everybody's trying to solve tech problems. Yeah, we cannot hear you. If you can hear us. Uh, Andrew, we cannot hear you. Just letting you know. Yep. Okay. Remember? All right. It's really cool. All right, if anybody can read lips, just tell us what Andrew's saying, because I'm sure he's also, talking if anybody some can read wild, minds, wild please, trash. Uh, invent a time machine and go back and win the million dollar James Randi educational fund. Yeah. Andrew. I watched the John Oliver clip. I didn't watch the whole segment, but I did watch the clip where he where he uh, talked about the, so, so, the Stasi. Uh, yeah, so sort of a mild swipe on on that. I, I it didn't feel like a like a hit piece at all. No, I mean I, they're political. I mean they're both you know like the 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 stop awesome. like I feel like that's like an uh, an appropriate way to criticize. Uh, Stossel, because they're both basically political essayists. The difference is that Stossel includes interviews in his, but like he's obviously there to make a point, and John Oliver's there to make a point. And that's uh, uh, uh it is, it is, it is what it is. I mean, I, I think that 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 the the general idea is uh, like, I and and I have not seen that specific Stossel report. But I don't know whether or not Stossel ever really came fully out of like, oh, no, we should like, even if we privatize the post office, that it should like not serve X amount of, uh, you know, the, the population or that it should be selling things for cheaper. Uh, so I don't know. It was all right. Uh, it yeah. looks like Andrew might be back on the line. You there? Yeah, I switched. I have two networks here, so I switched to the other network, so hopefully that works. So. Okay, cool. cool. Um, well, if you can take it back, you were talking about um, Facebook was right. is working on gliders. If you can kind of start from there, and we'll, we'll just pick it up back there. Yeah. Uh, so the problem of, let's say, trying to do everything satellite-based for internet communications is that it takes an awful lot of satellites to cover an area with a lot of population density. But that's why Facebook was experimenting with gliders and to test those out, and they were able to keep those up for an extremely large amount of time using solar power. And to your point, Brian, in using the microwave beaming, you know, with those gliders, absolutely you could keep them up indefinitely and just keep throwing more of those up in the sky when, you know, we have to do podcasts. Here, here's a nutty idea, and, and almost certainly somebody smarter than me has thought about this, but uh, part, of the, part of the beef, and it's not really a beef, uh, Part, part of the inherent problems I see with the idea of using, uh, you know, large uh, floating balloons to broadcast Internet is that eventually boon, balloons either pop or, or lose their uh, helium or hydrogen. Um, all of a sudden, I realized that if you have an energy source that can beam down enough microwave go-go juice to, uh, to, to, to refill batteries, you could have a big old balloon. Let's say it's a Mylar balloon that's very unlikely to pop. Um, and in it, it's filled with hydrogen, but then you could do a thing where when it starts to run down, it could descend into the clouds, collect water, get beams, use its energy from the beam zapper and use electrolysis to refill its own hydrogen where, I mean, as long as they're all cooperating, you, you, you can essentially keep those afloat forever, right? Maybe uh, it's an interesting idea. I don't think I've ever heard that before. You know, that could, if you, if you're, yeah, like you're saying, if you, if you're not worried about the power requirements because you're getting it from some external source, I and, think and, Brian, and certainly you may there's, have a, there's a, plenty of water up there, right? Uh, well, it, it, high, the the ones they're using are like a hundred thousand feet, but there's probably there's there's like a 
there's research out there right now for using like satellite thrusters that are able to pick up enough molecules in the outer outer atmosphere to go do that. I, I'm sure the idea though that the, the point is like yeah, it could descend to a point where there is, and I think there's a DARPA grant in there. I think you need to repurpose. <laughs> I think I'm wasting my life in in, in podcasting and YouTube. <laughs> well, I, it, oddly enough, sometimes you find out you know, where a lot of some of these ideas come from and the people that come from where it's just they think about a thing like that. Like that's certainly, certainly because like, yeah, the, because the bigger thing be like, oh, we need a lot of power. You're like, well, ha, yes, we have this. And it's like, well, oh, then maybe it will work. And, you know? and somebody in the chat room rightly points out like, well, why not just, uh, you know, a, a drone with propellers uh, on it? Uh, I suppose my only response is fewer moving parts. And in general, things with fewer moving parts tend to last longer. Yeah, the balloons are a lot cheaper. And the what Google did with the Project Loon is one, it was like, I don't know, Ballard or one of the people who had been the experts that, that Richard Branson had gone to it and told him like, oh, you're never going to keep one aloft for more than a few days or whatever. And they broke every single record of that. And then they were using mathematical algorithms, the best kind of algorithms, I guess, are the mathematical ones. <laughs> they were using them to, to they're they're using those to predict the where they were going to go and where they were going to land. So they had a pretty good idea of knowing how far up they were going to go, what point they were going to lose their hydrogen, and where they could go pick them up again. And so that was another part of it was they would apply kind of some big data to it. So. Uh, yeah, I it's, guess I guess that, that that's the other thing that pops into my mind is if I picture the world surrounded by balloons. Pretty quickly, I imagine them all clumping together. But but I then I remember that wind doesn't necessarily go the same direction at all stratas. And and if you're able to sort of manufacture or you know your own elevation by by virtue of of exchanging energy for more or less hydrogen, um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe, maybe there is something to that to keep them all constantly flowing around, but constantly inflated and constantly up there. Well, yeah, there's entire currents of, 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 you know, we talk about the jet stream, there's, there's other streams like that that are consistent. That's how Branson was able to navigate the world in a balloon, was that they would descend into one thing, one wind stream that was going one way, then ascend into another to go another way and basically just take those and switch back and forth like they're changing currents and stuff. And, you know, if we, if we don't spend, it's kind of like the, once you spend time in the ocean, you realize, oh yeah, there's these current drifts and you go here to go southward, you go over here to be taken westward, et cetera. And wind is very much like that and it, very fast at high altitudes. Did, did I hear right that the weather is getting a little, and, and this is, this is some just so stuff that you hear, you know, from other people in the neighborhood, but, but I heard, uh, uh from wherever that source is that, um, uh, because there are fewer commercial airline flights, the fidelity of data that the National Weather Service is getting, because they do rely on uh, commercial flights that happen to be up there to report the various stuff that they learn, that uh, weather is getting just a little bit harder to predict in the middle of uh, uh, fewer flights. Uh, I, I No idea, uh, qualifier, don't know if that's true or not. But, but it's one of those things that kind of makes sense when you hear it, so you're tempted to believe it. Yeah, I have no idea. I didn't even know until you mentioned that they would even use that data, but but it makes I, sense. That, 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 it that kind of sounds though like the. I'm same, not a meteor man, so <laughs> it sounds like that thing that uh, people were talking about, where uh, because of the spectrum that 5G operates, that 5G is going to affect our ability to to forecast the weather. Because oh, it's it's aggravating the particles, and I oh, actually no. heard that Dr. Fauci doesn't like the weather, and so he's <laughs> keeping it from us. So I just that's a thing that I heard, <laughs> and I'm just repeating. <laughs> I heard that he grabbed the weather inappropriately, and oh. that's <laughs> yeah. I heard that Bill Gates uh, has a weather. The weather stole his girlfriend. Well, that's so that's now, why he founded yeah. the Center for Population Control, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and so uh, that's why we all uh, had to install a microchip to get Windows ninety eight. <laughs> uh, gentlemen, you know what's great about being able to do this is having exactly. everybody together. <laughs> you know. Uh, uh, folks, we love doing this show. It's a passion. From the second that we get our Bill Gates approved script, we know that it's time to disseminate the appropriate information. And that's why we rely on your donations at patreon.com slash weird things. Folks, 
it's not just the fact that a shadowy cabal of billionaires is making sure that you are thought controlled. It's also your own help. That's how they know it's working. Patreon.com slash weird things is where you support this show being live and independent each and every Monday. And if you become a patron right now, you can get a custom RSS feed that you can put into the podcatcher of your choice where you not only get this program, but also our after thing program, which includes subliminal messaging, making sure that you remain docile and compliant. That's patreon.com slash weird things. Nailed it. Thank you, Cogs. I mean, patrons. <laughs> so you read a story and you're like, man, I don't want this to be true, but then it's probably true. And you're like, man, I hope maybe I'm misinterpreting this. And you find out like, no, you're not. And then you're like, really? I know where this is headed. And yes, I'm sorry. Elon did name his child that name. Oh, oh, that's, <laughs> that's the least crazy thing. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I named it for the precursor to the SR-71 jet, as you know, as couples are, you know, prone to doing, you know, sure. <laughs> um, uh, I'm talking about the the spot, the Boston Dynamics robot. You heard about this? The latest no, play. I Remember we showed the video? So we showed the video a while back of the robot crawling along and like, oh, he's so helpful. And all he did was walk through every scene where people are carrying stuff and doing oh, work. Oh, we, and yeah, we, we criticized the marketing on the, the spot. We, we yes, thought that, that it yes. was a solution that, that clearly had no problem to solve. Well, they found a solution to solve. Okay. Okay. Apparently in Singapore, they're using spot to patrol parks and to tell people they need to be doing social distancing. Oh, Christ. <laughs> um all right uh uh how to put this uh i mean if it's good at walking let it walk yeah keep it take it walking six feet apart yeah sounds like it's good at walking less good at talking so more walking <laughs> less talking spot uh so okay we criticized it for being a helpful tool for contractors and construction officials uh uh is it not effective at surveillance tech? Like it seems like it would be it would be effective at surveillance tech. I I I'm saying that like when I was a kid, you'd read these science fiction stories about people rioting against robots and stuff. I'm like, that's not what it's gonna be like. We're gonna think robots are cool. We're not gonna complain. Now, if your first interaction is you know you're sitting on a picnic blanket with your significant other relaxing an appropriate thing and some robot comes over to you to tell you hey <laughs> I, th I, I think i think you're four on the floor i think you're absolutely on the right track andrew in that this is not a human disaster this is not a real disaster of anything that actually matters i will say this is a very wrong-headed pr move this is a very poor use of this technology uh, let's Let's also understand that the Singapore government has cared very little about the PR elements of their <laughs> rules. You I'll know, tell you what, they, man, clean streets, man. <laughs> not not a speck of gum. I mean, look, yeah, there is there is certainly when I went to Singapore, you know, it was it was it's a beautiful place, a, uh, certainly a a a a gigantic city state amongst other nations that are not quite as uh, uh, advanced, but. Boy, howdy, do they not give a crap about your personal liberties? <laughs> like they, they, they are, they are there to maintain that there is a clean and efficient society, and that is their number one goal. So it, it does not shock me that that Singapore led the charge on something like this. Yeah, I, we've seen a side of certain bureaucrats here that I, I, I don't think it's going to stop there. I mean, you know, I, I do think that there is an element of drone technology and robot technology that, uh, you know, it is now becoming cheap enough that you can see many people, including businesses, but also government, looking at it as now a tool. All right. If this is a tool, if a vendor can go to a state capital and say, look at this problem we can solve for X amount of money and a politician thinks it's viable to give them that money so they can be the one to say that they brought blank, then, yeah, I do think that there's probably a, 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 a spot for something like this. This 
feels to me if I if I'm going to put on a conspira a conspiratorial hat, um, <laughs> because we haven't done that at all so far. Well, but but uh, it, it seems to me like if what you want to do is normalize uh, these things being in the park, this is a very good sort of low consequence. Hey, man, we're just reminding people to socially distance. We're being pro social and all that stuff. And then it becomes less weird for these to be positioned one every mile on your hike a bike trails or whatever. And then uh, it seems reasonable that when somebody calls 911 before the operator even answers the phone, the geolocation of the 911 call would be picked up and one of these things would immediately be awakened and be sprinting out to get eyes on the actual scene. Um, that also sees re seems reasonable. And once you're doing that, Seems reasonable to keep them just, you know, kind of patrolling all the time. You know, why have them sit and wait to be activated when they could autonomously be wandering around at all times? I I don't, I, yeah, I mean, I guess everybody has the line. It's different for them. Like, if there's, like, traffic drones and stuff, measuring stuff, like, I get it. I think that's, I, eh, I think it's fine because a lot of times you see people get away with stuff that you know, maybe shouldn't. I guess for me, it's the idea that, like, you know, if you're in a park, you're in a park, you know, which is, it's, it's really like, and my frustration, like, there's like zero evidence of cases of outdoor, you know, contagion from this thing and whatever. And we're seeing people who are trying to police the wrong behaviors and stuff. And that's sort of my frustration is that it becomes, it's that slippery slope, you know, where I'm like, oh, I'm okay with this. But to your, to your point, it's like, yeah. And then all of a sudden, what about this? You know? Yeah, I guess I guess what I'm suggesting is that uh, if if you want to project nefarious instincts or or if you eventually want these patrolling looking for crime all the time, then it seems like this issue is soft enough that it would be good to wear the public out, like get them shouting now so that it doesn't get them shouting about something that doesn't matter so that when you do cross that line, nobody's interested in revisiting that old topic. Yeah, I, I think yeah. Th this particular situation that we're in now is giving us a lot of real time examples in things. And, you know, uh, obviously, economically, we're watching what happens when you when you voluntarily turn off an economy. And we're going to find out what happens when you try to turn it back on again. Uh, civics, like we understand there's a lot of real time examples of delegation of power. What a mayor can do versus a governor can do versus a president can do. Uh, but in this particular case, I think that we're looking at, uh, and we are the bigger conversation that will come f emerge from this is as we think about how do we guard against this going forward, there's going to be a conversation about civil liberties and there's going to be a conversation about how much, you hand over to the government, there's going to be a conversation about how much the government can remind you and how harsh those those reminders can be. You know, uh, to that to that point here in Oakland, uh, we have this great lake that's Lake Merritt that's, you know, right around from my house. And it is during the spring and summer, the destination. People go Saturdays and Sundays, weather's gorgeous, barbecue, blah, blah, blah. And uh, now as the weather has gotten a little bit better, a lot more people at the lake. Uh, and now there is some tension with the local government about like, well, okay. The mayor has said things like we'll shut down the lake, but then again, how do you do that? Right? Like is, is there a, a benefit from their point of view of, of finding a non confrontational way to issue some kind of warning or fine. Uh, and, and that's, that's going to be the questions that we have going forward as uh, this example is in people's heads. Yeah, I guess my, the, the thing that's sort of frustrating is that the, our public health officials aren't all on the same page. <laughs> I know we noticed this. <laughs> Andrew brings a newsflash. And that is a thing where you hear some people like, oh, we got to go do this, this, this. And then you talk to people, epidemiology people, experts and stuff like, no, nah, you don't need to shut that down. It doesn't make any sense because you don't get exposed out there, whatever, it's safe. But you get that that mindset of, and it's it, and then you get the, you know, the, my frustration is like, when you overreact in some ways, you get fatigue and then we right. lapse in other cases. And now it's just... I, I will say, like, one of my first reactions was, this seems like an awful lot of hardware to accomplish what a very small drone could do. But 
it occurs to me that there's much less noise pollution with this. Like if, if, if they're going to be there and able to wander around and see everything and tell people, Hey, you two break it up. Um, then the choice between a constant whining of a beehive over me versus something that stays static and occasionally engages to walk over and says, you know, Hey, you two, uh, you mind splitting it up a little bit? Um, I, 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 would, would you rather have uh, divorced from the politics of everything? Uh, because also that that alone is a fascinating question that I feel like the UK has been going through in their love of CCTV and the, their perception that the moment you set out uh, your door, you know, you're in your quote unquote in public and, you know, everywhere should be videotaped at all time. But um, but this versus a flying drone, which do you prefer? Which is more creepy, less creepy? Which would you prefer patrolling our parks? Well, I don't think you need any of them patrolling the park for this thing. Cause like my problem is, is like, that is literally from what we understand, zero chance of anybody getting infected in that environment. It is such a waste of effort in all this because like, well, we see people there, we got to go do something. And it's like, eh, I don't think that's really, you know, like to me, that's my, my problem is like, is such a, from my understanding of it, again, I will, I'm ready to be staying corrected the chance of exposure to public environment like that is zero. It is effectively zero. And Granted. so to me, it's like- all, all of that, we're on the same page, but hello, it's me, your city mm-hmm. council member. Uh, also, the budget's already been approved. I just need you to check one. Would you like me to spend it on flying drones or dog drones? Check one. The money spent, <laughs> it's happening no matter what. I am quitting the city council right now. <laughs> uh, oh, resigns in protest. <laughs> Uh, I, I, I mean, the, the, the dog drone is less invasive. It's less quiet. I mean, it's quieter, you know, it, it's that it's creepy though. It's creepy as, as get out the, 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 the flying drone feels more Orwellian. Yeah. Um, but, uh, let me, let me make it clear, you know, <laughs> that none I, uh, of this is necessary. I'm d- trust me, man. Yeah, if there's yeah. anybody me, who's going to lend a sympathetic ear, it's let me, me just I'm say with this. you on yeah. that. I don't. Uh, and and I think we're probably all on the same page in terms of the, the we're more on the let's let's err on the side of protecting civil liberties. But if you're going to give me some creepy dog century drone, it better also pick up the trash. Like, you know, yeah. like you got to at oh, least. Oh, that's like, what you if, do. If, that's if, how you sell it to the public is that it's constantly doing good. It's constantly cle- yeah. cleaning up and tidying. It's art has it, it has hand sanitizer and masks. That's one of my frustrating things is like you've seen these things like police showing up to disrupt something. You're like, man, these police officers aren't wearing masks. <laughs> you're like, maybe just show up and give people masks. Let's do that. The, let's let's the, instead of there writing is a fines, bit of a, like, a PR disaster. It, it, it's funny actually. That was literally uh, 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 Marshawn Lynch, one of the local luminaries here in Oakland. Uh, he went around the lake that I was just referring to and just handed out masks to everybody because he's a good guy. Big ups nice. to, yeah. to Marshawn, Nin- Marshawn Lynch. And that's, I think that's, that's the, you know, it's like, Hey, what do we do? when like, there was, you know, people were getting pregnant and STDs, everybody stop having sex. No, wear a thing, wear a thing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's also like, also like, like let's what, just... what, what an easy firewall between you and the hot button political issue is like this headline could have said robot dogs deliver masks to those in need. Also, mm-hmm. you know, the third paragraph, also, they happen to mention, could you guys stand a little farther apart? I'd really like that. Yeah. You know, like, like uh, sure. what, what an easy way to dodge a PR disaster. It's a 180. It's absolutely 180. You know, it, it's that, and it's it's that the thing that's there to punish you or getting you that warning, like, and that's how we, pre- and that's, I think that's part of the problem is people don't understand, like, oh, we just want to tell people, like, if I'm sitting there and a dumb robot comes up to tell me, and I'm next to my girlfriend who I've been living in the same place with, you know, locked inside, and it's the first time outside, hey, remember to practice social distancing, what are you telling me, you know, like, I'm going to be angry. If it's like, hey, here's some free sanitizer and some masks. I'm like, oh, cool. And and I'm I've got a big thing of ale around my neck, and you can drink from this well, <laughs> Saint Bernard. 
even that you uh, when you get to the part where your your quote unquote real motives of keeping people apart you know then you just say like hey just to check you guys are aware that you should be six feet apart right yes okay so i i noticed that you're not six feet apart could you just say for the record that 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 you have heard this and that you're cool with it and you're choosing to do this on your own or whatever like like a mild disclosure or whatever to um it reminds me of a bit of a cialdini's influence book where uh he went around and um if what you want is a pro-social thing to happen like recycling then what you do is you go door to door and you give people a certificate for being awesome at recycling and then they sign it and you, they hang it up on the wall they're like i'm an awesome recycler or whatever then that's all you have to do and then suddenly that neighborhood has 30 percent more people participating in recycling just by virtue of identifying as somebody who recycles or whatever so likewise you can get across the message that uh hey you guys should be farther apart without authoritarian style shouting you should be farther apart but instead saying hey you know you seem cool did you know that your risk of getting a whatever is increased by so much percent by whatever yes i do understand and once somebody identifies as somebody who understands that it's very hard to engage in the antisocial behavior once you've identified the pro-social route. But doesn't it feel more oppressive to make a, like, engage with me, human, and say whether it is or isn't on the record? Like, like I bet it's more effective for sure, but also that doesn't, if well, we're talking about the you, feeling of oppression, doesn't that feel more oppressive? Whether or not that's more Machiavellian. Yeah, well, you that's... Can, you can, you... Oh, go yeah, ahead. So you can word it. Yeah, to your point, you can just word it, be like, "Hey, do me a favor, tell other, remind other people to just keep their part," and it does that. You like the, you know the, the Cialdini thing. You say, "Oh, just do me a favor, just remind other people to do this," and they're like, "Ah, yes, I've taken the mantle upon myself." To help spread the totalitarian method. Well, and, and the new version of this is the UK a few years ago created what they called the nudge unit, which is a bunch of behavioral economists uh, figuring out small changes they can make. For example, forms like, for example, organ donation. Uh, right now, America has a, in general, an opt-in policy, which means you have to do a thing saying, yes, carve up my dead body and give the organs to other people. Whereas other countries have a opt-out thing where, where it's like still same choice either way. It's just the default option is one way or the other and so other countries have a lot more uh, organ donation so the nudge unit uh figured out like uh for when it came to taxes they they tried a whole bunch of different uh mailers that they sent out to people the best performing of which was not saying hey your taxes pay for the police and other important things not it's your important civic duty or whatever the most uh, effective nudge they found was to simply say did you know that 80% of all people file their taxes by this date and most of them uh, uh, do blank, blank, or blank? Just knowing that the norm, the societal norm was this thing caused them to see massive upticks in participation or whatever. So I, yes, it's more Machiavellian and creepy to think about using behavioral psychology and economics like that, but also less uh, asshole -ish, I guess. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. 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 I mean, I think it just breaks down to the the argument of like, all right, well, even when it comes to technology for the police, like are, are the police there to prevent is, is the highway patrol there to prevent uh, uh, roadway disasters or to give me a ticket? Right. Like, like that's that's the line that uh, hopefully the government can always stay on the right side of where we're this is a, a beneficial thing for everybody and not a hassle where you are being targeted. Yeah. So uh, one more story. Good news, everybody. We found the closest black hole to Earth, or so astronomers claim. Uh, this, okay. isn't, this isn't the possible 10th planet? No, no. This is, a, this is more of a, not the theoretical one from last week, like there could be. This is a... And we got a thing. We've seen a thing. And we're pretty sure this is a black hole. Anyhow, let's let's take some guesses here. How close? Oh my God! Uh, in the Oort cloud? God, that would be disturbing. If it, if it can Damn. be seen, I'd like to think it's at least a light year or two away. So I'm going to say two light years away. Please, please be that far. Yeah, I would say ten, twelve feet. <laughs> right. Oh, I already saw the answer. I was pulling up so, the story. So knowing yeah. that, what's your guess? <laughs> I, <laughs> I might, I might guess that. Uh, and Andrew, tell me if I'm if I'm close. It might be a thousand light years away. Ding ding! Correct. 
I'm so, comfortable uh, with that. A thousand light years. That, that, uh, yeah. so, so, so I won't die for at least a thousand years, and my children won't die, and my grandchildren. Anyway. Well, if we put you in a spacecraft and move you at relativistic speeds, Brian, you could actually die within your own lifetime there. All right. Look, we all, we all have ambitions and goals. I like this. <laughs> something something yeah. to wake up for every day. Yeah. Uh, so in your internet will really suck. There so is so that is this, point of it. So, uh, in this case, uh, h how have they confirmed the black hole? Is it from like a, a visual occlusion or, or radio blah, 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 or whatever? Well, they sent an email. They gave it 15 minutes to respond. Are you not a black hole? It didn't apply. <laughs> My favorite method of confirmation. <laughs> yeah. So apparently they were looking at like a triple system of like stars or something. And it just was really wonky and like a trinary. And apparently from the evidence of that, they said the explanation for how they'll be able to hold together would, I guess, be the presence of a black hole. That's crazy. Andrew says Andrews is out of his butt, not really knowing, having only skimmed the article. But, but, I, I guess that's that's kind of wild because um, uh, a trinary system in and of itself is a fairly chaotic, insane uh, dance uh, that is difficult to predict with Newtonian physics. But very rarely do I hear that the solution is to make it even more complicated by adding a fourth uh, incredible body. So, so th uh, th that does sound very, very extraordinary. Yeah, and they reminded us too. Uh, let us not forget the supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy that is four point six million times the mass of our sun. Holy cow! I watched a um. Uh, there's a lecture series where somebody is. Uh, it's very academic. It's it's not. Um, it's interesting because as somebody who swims in the YouTube think piece uh, space. Uh, normally you would see this like, you know, uber polished, cut down with fancy animations or whatever. This is straight up a, a astronomer just talking to a webcam. But uh, I, I love the conceit of it. He says uh, I, the series is the universe is quite disappointing, really. And the very first episode is about how stars are shockingly weak. And if you take the mass of a star compared to its energy output, the human body uh, puts out more energy per kilogram than the sun by a lot. And now granted, most of our energy goes out in infrared in a non-visible way and the sun does it in a visible way. Uh, and, uh, you know, and then he goes on to explain like, well, keep in mind also that the majority of the star is fuel and the engine that is running fusion at the middle uh, is very small compared to the entire thing. But uh, this is a really fun series. I like it quite a bit. Oh yeah! All right, now do quasars, man. Tell us those are weak, huh? huh? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't. I can't wait to see where it goes. I, 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 you know, that's that's a pre-pick pick. Yeah, well, that's the thing too. Like when they talk about how when our sun will eventually expand into a red giant and will go past where uh, the orbit of Earth, you're like, oh my god! But then you're like, well, a red giant's like a big ball of gas, <laughs> you know, big ball of hot gas. Yeah, and, it's still the same sun. It's the, all the same mass. It's just, it's just. Brrr you know, just uh, 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 converted into different stuff that spreads out easier. Yep. So space is cool. I'm a fan. I say we keep it. Yeah. Vote space 2020. <laughs> Gentlemen, picks? Man, I finally hopped on that devs train. What'd you think? Mm -hmm. What'd you think? Five episodes in? Kind of love it. And I'm waiting to, I, I know that Bryce had beef with it, um, Bryce hates it. I have uh, yeah, Bryce, specific oh, criticisms dude. of it. <laughs> Bryce just, oh, he was talking even just before the show, like, dude, Dev sucks, but I hate it. I'm, I'm enjoying it. Oh my it. God, Dev's is awful. My name is Bryce Castillo, and I just think Dev's is trash. Put it in a dumpster. That's where trash lives. I mean, that, they should call it the Dev's cage. I mean, that's what I'm going to call dumpsters from now on. I, I am enjoying being on what I think of as Bryce Watch, waiting for the part. <laughs> To figure out what parts Bryce wouldn't like, uh, but yeah, so far, all man, all of them. You've already watched every frame, and that's it. Bryce uh, hates all of it universally. You are in the midst of the stuff that I didn't love as I didn't like as much. Um, right? but yeah, no, uh, uh, but Alex Garland's—that's the guy's name. That's right. Uh, man, oh man, mm -hmm. uh, much like Sam Esmail, dude knows how to set up a shot. Gorgeous, just gorgeous, mm -hmm. and. 
Um, I understand that the story, the way you tell a story in any kind of video format is different from the way you tell a story in a book or a comic or, or live person to person. Or even in a movie. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's fair enough. Like, I understand there's certain amounts of shorthand that you have to use, and I'm, I'm comfortable with it. Um, digging it? Quite a bit. In fact, uh, Josie, my 12-year-old, has joined me for a bit of it. A uh, bit weird watching Marilyn R Monroe have sex with uh, Arthur Miller at some point uh, with a 12-year-old. <laughs> but, uh, but, but outside of that, uh, I'm, I'm liking it quite a bit. I, and, and Bryce, upon hearing that, that I hadn't tapped out already, kind of said, I think you'll like Ew, the ending. gross. You have awful taste. <laughs> hey, I'm puking right now. I'm Bryce. I hate devs. <laughs> Was that it? Because that's what I would guess. It was. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> close. He's, he said right. that he thought he thought that I would enjoy the ending. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm enjoying it quite a bit. Yeah. Hey, you you watched I, it too recently, right, Andrew? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. I think I texted uh, you all about that because, like, yeah. I I thought that I like Alex Garland a lot because he is. You, there's so much bad sci-fi and bad stuff out there, and it, and I'm up for, like I can watch a thing that come to a completely different opinion than I have, and I can enjoy it thoroughly. I just want people to explore the topic, to really kind of go, well, if this is true, then what does this mean? And not just let's just have a thing because it's cool and it's a thing to throw out there. I'd rather go, let's explore this. And I thought Garland did that. You know, I had X Machina. I had a couple minor kinds of things where I'm like, like man, like the. Uh, the, the 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 security in this guy's house seems really like a lot of bad ideas that would probably cause problems later on. And you're like, wow, this caused problems. Later. And I, but that was not germane to the point he was getting at and the thing he got to. X Mac, and I thought was great. And here he's dealing with another technology sort of topic and thinking through it really thoroughly. And I and I like. And I may not go like, oh, I think he's right about this because my opinion matters. But and I actually think largely I love what he's doing, the things he's exploring. And so I, I loved it. And visually, Brian, like, what did you think of the way he, like, the, the, we don't want to spoil about what we're seeing, but the sure. way some of that technology is visualized, though, I thought was gorgeous and amazing. Yes. And again, uh, that's sort of what I'm alluding to when I talk about, like, the rules for television are different than the rules for a book or whatever. It's like, sorry, is it pretty? Because if it's not pretty, then we can't put it in the show. We have to figure out a reason for it in there. Um, I, I, I would just did feel. I like, would just say, if we're talking about the rules of, of telling a story, I would say, I would maybe say, don't set up and then completely resolve all of the mystery for the first six episodes in the first one. I would just, I, I would just say maybe like. Let's have a little more mystique. Oh, that's maybe interesting. Maybe make a because... good show. These prices. It's <laughs> like no, I mean, you the show of... is is a steaming pile of poop. And maybe if you made a good show, Bryce would have liked it better. Is that is <laughs> that fair, Bryce? <laughs> that's interesting because I actually really dig how fast stuff moves. Like about the time that I think. Oh, they're gonna make us sit through a bunch of nope. They're done. <laughs> We've moved on. Yeah. They 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 immediately have a character say, uh, yeah yeah, we get it. This thing. All right, we're moving on. And I'm like, wow, that's great. Uh, I I very rarely get that from a television show. Mm -mm -mm. Yeah. yeah, I I was very glad once I realized it wasn't the thing you think it's gonna be about in the first few episodes because I was gonna be very disappointed because that that is techno plot number one. That is every. Brilliant inventor with a secret. Okay, blah, blah, blah. We know where this is going. There was just a movie out the circle with the David Egg. Like, this is like the most predictable. That's the most predictable kind of thing to me. And I once they kind of kept moving, it kept going deeper and deeper. I'm like, oh, oh, that was just to sort of get you into the door into what this is really going to be about. So, yeah, yeah hard, hard moves and also characters. Uh, I, I'm pretty sure, Justin, this will pass your spoiler smell test. Some characters do things that you would disagree with, and you might be tempted in most stories to reduce that person to a bad person. But instead, you get to watch that character wrestle in agonizing pain with the bad thing they had to do, and I enjoy that quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Ruined. <laughs> <laughs> Justin, do you have a pick? Uh, yeah. I really have liked the... Uh, uh, last two episodes of Rick and Morty. I really, I particularly liked the one last night. Uh, it's good to have that show back. Uh, speaking of a uh, a, a show that uh, has a tendency to keep ahead of you plot wise, I, I thought the the one last night was a great example of that. There was everything was kind of 
constantly moving in in a way that uh, uh, you didn't expect, and I'm happy that it exists. That's very interesting, and I don't want to provoke any kind of argument outside of to say like Brian says not, he hates it. He I've, I've, I've not oh, like oh <laughs> Brian hates Rick and Morty. The last oh, two episodes, Rick and Morty. Uh, uh, last episode, I was like, you know what, didn't land for me. Uh, you know, too 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 much self-referential, too much loud shouting. None of this counts, and it's like, well, if none of this counts, then I'm not dialed in. I I I can totally get where you did not like the the other episode. Like I I think the best the best uh uh, uh description of it was in the in the uh, explaining the episode bit where Dan Harmon's like, yeah, this one got away from us because <laughs> I think that <laughs> there's there's like. It it was smart and fun, and at a certain point, it's like either you care about the things or you don't, and that's kind of the strength of Rick and Morty is that you do care. There, there is more than just uh, uh, the like, oh, we're gonna do a thing despite the fact that they can go anywhere. And I thought the second episode did a lot better job than the first one. Well, and the second episode certainly dove in deep to that pocket, but but um, there's a moment. That uh, like like they definitely develop a world and a story, and for that I I, I tip my hat. But there is definitely a moment that Morty says, "What was the point of this? Did we learn anything? Did we grow at all?" And the answer is no, no. This might as well have been just like the other episode where I'm not sure what what the big story got moved by this at all was. And I mean, so it's, com- it's complicated, right? I think it's a bit about the complication of war. I don't know. Well, yeah, I think that line specifically is about like they certainly they are the bad guys and they're wrestling with like <laughs> the fact that like, oh, wait, did we get better? No, they actively got worse and they're trying to rationalize what lesson they they could write it off as. Yeah, I guess uh, that's how I that's how I read that. At least. I guess, and, and I think I think you're 100 percent right. I think that my favorite Rick and Morty episodes get stuff spun up, wound up really, really tight and then find a landing that releases all that energy this one did really good at winding everything up and then they just decide to watch tv at the end and and so that that that's sort of, uh, 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 mostly uh, uh, like it was 80 percent of the journey and no release interesting for me um i got a pick i had y'all muted by the way so. <laughs> uh i have a pick and uh apologies to andrew if i'm sniping your pick i'm i'm sorry for it um, but I uh, finished binging over the weekend uh, Amazon's Upload, uh, which is uh, it's an eight-part series from Greg Daniels. That's the name I was thinking, not Michael Schur, Greg Daniels, who uh, uh, worked on the U.S. office. And uh, boy, howdy, if that doesn't look like the good place, if it's a little, if it's a little good placey. Uh, but it, it, it's basically about uh, a, a near future where uh, people can upload themselves to a virtual afterlife. Um, you do it before you die and then you can live virtually for free. But then you get in there and it's it's like a capitalist hellscape where there's ads and you have to pay and you're microtransacted for everything. And um, and then they do a very weird thing that I, I like, but I don't know that I, I don't like it on paper, but I like it in execution that they kind of wrap up this big mystery storyline into it that I think was, that I think is good. I think if you told me it was also kind of a mystery thing, I wouldn't have liked it, but I think the way they pull it off and kind of how it resolves, I think are, are, are nice. And, and it sets a, it's a, it certainly sets up for a second um, interesting season. I don't know. Andrew, what did you think about upload? I, I was very, very wary going into it. Uh, I was very skeptical of it. And absolutely, I, I remember watching some of the trailers for it and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, it felt kind of good placey kind of thing, which I liked. And then I realized it's like, this is like, it's funny because you had Michael Sherwood did The Good Place and uh, Greg Daniels did this. So two guys who worked on The Office kind of doing their own thing. This I describe as The Good Place beats Westworld. And I really mean that. And because there is an overarching plot going on. But it is a story, it's a sitcom or story set in a world where kind of post-singularity, you can live after death, but it's not free, by the way, Bryce, where he lives is very expensive. Oh, right. The monthly rate, there are, but there are other cheaper offer, there are other cheaper heavens that you can live in, very other cheaper simulations you can have your personality live in, including uh, Disney's Eternity. And then there's uh, 
was it Panera Facebook Las Vegas yes. and these other they they sound like hellscapes is what's supposed to meant and so I loved it because I imagine it reminds me of like 1990s internet you know the idea that if we ever have the ability to upload into places our first ideas and the environments we create and what we're going to want to do are probably going to be horrific. They're going to be pretty bad. And, I think it's very yeah. funny in the first episode where they're like, here's this, be- it's it's modeled after the ski resort and it's beautiful when there's food and stuff. And uh, don't look over there. That's a data stream where you can just act, where people go and suicide themselves. And we don't like that. We give our customer service yeah. reps bad, ra- ra- bad ratings when they do that. Yeah. Um, so yeah. yeah, there's definitely a lot of the jagged edges on that, which is, is, is endearing it, it became endearing to me over time um, watching the show. And I think, yeah, I, mm-hmm. I, oh, please. Oh, and I think there's a really interesting storyline um, with uh, it, the, the two primary characters are this guy who's been uploaded and the customer service rep who he talks to a lot. And she has a very good storyline with her father who is uh, very skeptical and doesn't, you know, kind of doesn't want, it needs some pr- provoke, some pushing to actually join the upload program eventually and uh i i think it's really fascinating seeing um th- trying to give give some some thoughts based to well like if you were a religious person and you believe in the afterlife why what what would it mean to upload yourself to a digital afterlife and what would that mean to the generations of people who might be expecting you in heaven like uh i, I think there's i think they cover a lot of really good ground in it yeah, they they do a really good way of sort of like you, you get into sort of a little bit of farce where like, you know, there's a lot of gags and stuff in there, too. But they try to the characters are real and they try to deal with some real problems. And also the idea that, like, you know, you're dead and you're living in this sort of virtual environment, but you can still make phone calls and call your friends and stuff. But it's funny because, like, nobody gives an F, though. You're like, hey, what's going on? Like, ah, not, not any time for you. You know, you're at your own funeral and everybody else is just carrying on. Like, hey, I'm over here. And it's like. It's yeah, 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 yeah. We know you. Like, it's, anyhow, da 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 da. It's very bizarre that they hold a funeral where you could just like talk to the people on this big screen, and you have the phone video calls almost at any point. You know, I think I don't know if that also feeds into some of the the sort of jagged edges of it, where like I think if this was a technology that had been around for hundreds of years or thousands of years, they would. The, like society would be very different. You, you, if you got uploaded, there would not be a funeral. You would just have a new friend who lives online instead. And and I think yeah, it's interesting that I, they're not at that turning point. Yeah, I I, I liked it because I think about like about devs. I liked about devs was I thought that I thought that Garland really explored the topic and really well had had original meaningful things to say. Has meaningful things to say, and I'm really curious, Brian, to see what your thoughts are going to be on that going through there. And and asking questions that a lot of writers wouldn't even think to do because they're going to be on the surface. And I feel the same way about this is that is that they're they bring things up about like this sort of, you know, when you can live in a digital afterlife, what are how, what is your life like? You know, and like they talk about, like, if you're in a digital afterlife, you can't have a real job because they don't want people. Dead people competing with living people. And there's little things that get thrown out there. They're like, mm-hmm. This is a really cool examination of the topic. I wonder if it's getting a, uh, a an emotional bump, given that the way you guys have described the afterlife, a little bit like sheltering in place, where, hey, man, I'm here. <laughs> I could do work uh, virtually. I could send you things. I could talk to people. What do you want me to do? It's not crazy, especially because the main character, this is, this is not a spoiler, but kind of the main character has additional restrictions under which he lives in and cannot even really enjoy this afterlife the way everyone else gets to. Um, I, I, I don't know. I think maybe that's a little, that's a part of it. Yeah. Uh, my casting. only contribution to this is that apparently the main character is portrayed by an actor by the name of Robbie Amell, who got so shamed for how he threw a football in a movie he did years and years ago that he made his pregnant wife record him throwing a football so he could show that he actually could throw it properly. That's amazing. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> also, since you were comparing it to The Good Place, I'm watching The Good Place with my kids, and man, does that show fall off in the fourth season, which is not an indictment of the fourth season so much as a testament to just how on top of their game are they were by the by the third season. Was uh, the fourth one the last one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. It got a little yeah, there's uh, sh- water, water tready. Yeah, there's shows that they resolved. It's like, I'm finished. We just watched season five of Shit's Creek. 
And I'm like, this is fun. It was done a season and a half ago. Like it was, they, they resolved the things they set out to resolve. And now we're watching these sort of like, ah, what if we run over a cat plot? It's <laughs> like, okay, same as anybody running over a cat, you know, but uh, it's such a yeah. likable cast though. Yeah, that I mean, yeah, yeah. Shit, Shit's Creek is just like just them reacting, them them reacting to running over a cat is is uh, uh you know high high art in my book. But I, I I agree with you. At a certain point, if you wanted to pop that plot for maximum effect, it it probably could have happened a little earlier. I uh, I showed my girlfriend some stuff from Green Acres. So yeah, by the way, you know, watch this show, you know, and she's like, oh wow. I'm like, yeah, what well, you know, rolling shit. Meet Mr. Haney, <laughs> you yeah. know, pulls up on his truck, has got a thing. I said, it's just not that like, oh, it's this, but it is this sort of like these themes come up and over and over again and have, you know. Wow. Uh, you know. Yeah. Have we heard so. anything else with uh uh the the the, the Levies uh on, on what what is what is next for uh for either i mean i guess eugene levy you know is uh he'll do anything if if there's a principal then eugene levy's getting a call for it but uh uh the 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 kid obviously was the driving force there with Shit's creek i'm curious to see what they do next apparently dan levy hey, is running I... on happiest season i don't know oh huh. so uh uh eugene levy better looking now than 30 years ago weirdly yeah yeah. 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 I hope I get those jeans. <laughs> hope I can. Which I is can funny. Have that, and now you said that, and all I can think of is just him going, Well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> Second City, Eugene Levy. Look at that. Oh my yeah. goodness. Yeah. 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 Some guys get lucky like that, you know? Um, all right. My pick is uh, this is actually, I'm going to throw this out there again just because I'm very proud of my friends. I have two buddies, Jordan Gold and Simon Coronel, who have been working forever as magicians and guys who've loved puzzles. And they teamed up with Max Timken, who, you know, Cards Against Humanity fame. And they put out, I talked about this before, Magic Puzzle, which was their Kickstarter, which basically it's this puzzle that's once you put it together, there's some sort of magical thing that happens with it. They went, they blew past the million dollar mark on Kickstarter. Wow. It is the most funded puzzle wow. ever on Kickstarter and most number of backers. And I'm very, very proud of my friends, and I know they put so much time and effort into this. And so, that is just if you want to check out magic puzzles, yeah, that's great. Yeah, that's gonna crush. I mean, like that. I, I can't even think to project where that's gonna land, but that's that's a lot of coin. Good for them. It looks it yeah. looks really nice. I I haven't signed up, but I think I probably will because they look really nice. Yeah, you know, like over a year ago, Jordan called me up and he's like, "I've been thinking about working on puzzles and getting into <laughs> puzzles." And I'm like, dude, that is a horrible idea. Like, uh, you know, I all I know is puzzles end up in the commodities market. They're hard to, you know, hard to sell, whatever, because like, you know, like the markup's great, but that means that 80% of them don't sell, blah, 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 blah. And I just gave him into this sort of like, like your dream sucks. Give it up. Dumb idea. And, you know, I had to have that awkward phone call yesterday. No, I've been talking throughout this. So I'm like, I'm like, because he's like, yeah, I'm glad I didn't listen to you. I'm like, dude, that's the key is when you're so driven by a thing, you just keep doing it, you know? And mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it sounds a bit like the um, exploding kitten story in that like exploding kittens was a good game period, end of sentence, new sentence um, that was made public to the world by, uh, you know, the trusted name of the dude by uh, uh, the oatmeal. Uh, the, yeah, yeah, the only, yeah, Inman, Inman. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, uh, Matthew but, Inman. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's a case where uh, this feels very similar. Where if there's a there's an alternate universe where Jordan goes it alone uh, and doesn't partner with Max on this, and uh, mm -hmm. uh, and and it's a great thing that nobody hears about and doesn't get funded. But we live thankfully in the splinter reality where both of them, you know, they, they gather the attention well, and the value is good. Yeah, but also like. Jordan's really good friends with Elon Lee of Exploding Kittens, the one actually brought in uh, Oatmeal Guy into that. So the part of it's like, yeah, but it's I'm also like, I know that he had several people who wanted to work with him on something because what he's been doing is so creative and interesting. And that's the point I make is like, you could sometimes go, man, if I didn't have this happen, I'm like, yeah, but there are other people waiting in the wings. Sometimes there's not, and it's just fortuitous, but sometimes talent seeks talent. And so I've gone like, yeah, there needed a lot of things to come together, but I'm also know that like, he's had other people like, oh, I'd love to make something happen with you. And then he chose here and, and I think roll it back, maybe not the same way, but it's also it's like uh, the the this his 
his Rolodex is amazing. Like Jordan, who we know. Yeah. Yeah, Jordan, because he's such a talented guy. And, and you know, he's just a, a, a neat, neat guy that I know that a lot of people have been trying to find a thing to sort of make a thing happen with him. And Max was the one I think, you know, uh, keyed in right in how to make that happen. Yeah. yeah. So. Very cool. Gentlemen, it's been weird. Hey. That's a show. That's a show, everybody. Uh, all right, we'll take a quick break. Anybody go take a break, and we'll come back and do after things here in just a moment. Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah, the the magic puzzle. Cause I, I've heard uh, I, I've heard Max talk about it a little bit on on his podcast, and all the the fine details of of what goes into making even bad jigsaw puzzles, and what they have to do to make these really nice and. Seeing like you know when you make the the blades for a jigsaw puzzle, you can only get like ten cuts out of them or something like a ridiculously small. Oh really? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, that's that. Yeah, the the FAQ is great. We're like, oh, why are our puzzles better? Like, oh, no puzzle dust and all these like ah puzzle dust. I don't want that. I didn't know that was a thing. You yeah. know, like <laughs> these other garbage puzzles away from me. And like, look at how our die cuts are so perfect and things like. Uh, People who know things to care about that I didn't realize you should care about. Mm -hmm. And apparently they had um, Suzanne Care, Suzanne Carre. Yeah. Who did the original Mac uh, icons to do the logo for them. The move and all that. Yeah, she did the uh, logo for the the Magic Puzzle Company. And once you know that and you see the little, the little happy faces and you're like, oh, yeah, it's cute. Look at that. Yeah, I, I gave them a hard time. I said it looked like the uh, the, the the safe place thing signed for kids that looks like a totally not safe place with like the white guy, you know, grabbing the black kid off the street. Oh, jeez. Oh, uh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah. 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 It's just like, it's just, you should run from that. <laughs> Do you have any good advice for these guys here, Andrew? <laughs> Nope. Look, hey, look what <laughs> it's done for won, them. Justin. L look what it's done for them. They did opposites. You know, that's the key. Man, I'm I'm rethinking my entire life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah. Ooh. I I when I say nobody knows anything, I'm first in that line. <laughs> uh, let me see. I feel like we got an after things email recently and I want to make sure. Yeah. Get it. I got another. For after mm -hmm. thing with an S. Oh, uh, you guys have probably seen some of the stuff from, uh, this, uh, uh, mischief company, the, um, or not company, but like the group of people, um, called mischief or M S C H F. Yeah, me. They've done. Yeah. Um, uh, oh, there was. There that were... would be my pickup artist name. That would be what I would do. You know, I dress Ooh. like in purple, like the Joker, and I'd be like, I'm mischief. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let me see. Because I know there's some. Writing that down. Pickup artist name will be mischief. Uh, they made the original Netflix Hangouts. They did. Um... Let's see. What are some of these other ones? Anyway, they do like these internet based. Um, they're, they're kind of performance artists sort of works. Uh, they had one drop today. They do, they do them every, every other week or so. And it's a Slack, uh, server that you join that is in real time playing out episodes of the office every day, Monday through Friday, nine to five. Um, and so all of the characters have their own usernames and they'll, uh, you know, they'll, they have different, you know, the different channels and those kind of follow where the episode, the different parts of the episode take place, whether it's in. Michael's office or out and open or in the, oh in the that's interesting room. yeah that's uh, a lot of effort that's a, yeah it's a fun little project yeah mm -hmm. so Justin I gotta say the uh, up in the upper corner of your screen the the TV reflects like I keep waiting for the somebody that face mask to start move and you get I don't want to watch you get murdered but I feel like, like this jigsaw one or the other one. No, like if you look in your look in the at reflection where of the TV, it's yeah, the right there, uh, right, right. Yeah. Oh, you get the the what's it called the uh, Borderlands yeah. mask. Yeah. Well, maybe one day, 
maybe one day it'll just you know spring to life and take me out of my misery. Okay, well, uh, maybe I can't find that. Oh well. Oh wait, is this it? Okay, here we go. This one is um uh, maybe a little, uh a, a little dated, but I'm sure it is still um still very very helpful information. I'm gonna forward it to here you. Here, guys, Andrew. I'm planning on putting together an outdoor festival. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're... Dear guys, a few months ago, nearly 1,000 people contributed to what I like to call a founders club, and I wanted to have a picnic for them. <laughs> um, but I think this is this is good because I think we've we've touched on this subject of kind of tech tech stuff, but this, he's kind of got a specific hypothetical laid out. Mm -hmm. I've, yeah. I've oh, yeah. The chat about what's outdoors. I feel like outdoors was like in Mad Max Beyond the Thunderdome, like the kids talk about the Never Never and all that. Yeah, like, uh, uh, the, uh, out, uh, Tomorrow out, out, Land. Like, yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew or Justin, if you guys need to go get re do, your drinks or whatever. Do you guys know just a, a fun fun trivia tidbit here? What the number one Rotten Tomatoes highest scoring sci fi movie of all time is? You got to guess. Uh, Inception, maybe not bad. Uh, maybe I mean, Tomb Raider, yeah. uh, double duty there. <laughs> Empire Strikes Back is like the greatest science fiction movie of all time. Oh yeah, but... Star War. Uh, no, the uh, uh, Mad Max Fury Road is the oh. highest, uh, most positive. And, and, does, uh, and and keep in mind, you know, proviso, you know, Rotten Tomatoes does not measure measure, you know, artistic absolute quality so much as uniform. You know, uh, uh, global, yeah, global happiness with the thing. Yeah, Fury like, Road's like, a perfect. It's, it's a perfect it's movie. very hard it's to find anybody who's got beef with Fury Road. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a per it goes into my perfect movie category yeah, of like. It really is, man. Know, it's it's it's, 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 it's uh, I want to watch it back to back with Master and Commander because it's a naval battle movie. Hmm. Mm. Let's see that. Very good point. Uh, and that's Master how I Commander. killed the conversation. No. It was me that no, did it. No mystery Nash here. Commander. Peter Weir. Not a perfect movie, but a great movie, though. Uh, uh, La Last Mohican's a perfect movie. Last time I checked, like do you know what the number one comic book movie is on Rotten Tomatoes? Oh. This uh, might this might have changed, but, but I did see this at one point. Dark Knight? Not bad. Dark Knight, right? It was up there. Um, comic book. Watchmen? Uh, not a bad no. guest. It, it was decent God, enough no. up there in the, in the Pantheon. Mm. Yeah, there are some pretty bad comic book movies. Not Deadpool, yeah, not Ghost know. World. Joker. Wolverine. You Look. know what? Joker might have overtaken it since I last looked. So this is old mm. intel I'm running on. Mm. But when I, when I checked about two years ago, uh, it was Logan. Again, well-deserved. Like, not a lot of yeah. people I could find hating on Logan. No. And that was that was the movie that like Mangold and Hugh Jackman had to fight with the studio, had to fight with Fox to go make like Deadpool. They had to go fight with Fox to go. We really want to make this movie. Eh, we'll lower the budget. Like, all right, go make your movie and lose our money. Fine. Well, and, oh, and oh, plus oh, also, uh, I was part of the skeptical community that feared that they were going to add gratuitous cursing and nudity and violence for the sake of just, you know, like, let's get us that R rating where the money is like Deadpool. But, uh, but I'll be damned if, if it wasn't completely judicious use of it from beginning to end in Logan. Yeah. Why? Well, because like they mangled saw it as a Western, you know, I mean, it's changed. Just, and, 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 yeah. Yeah. So you, know, Logan, you saw it as that. Yeah. Logan's got a 93 tomato, 90 audience. Endgame has a 94 tomato Four. and a 90 audience. Yeah, that would have been before Endgame, yeah. And Joker is at 68 tomato, 88 audience. Uh, I, I, I stand behind, like, uh, Joker will be very polarizing. That uh, yeah. so, so if it's not for you, it's not for you. Uh, so I forwarded you that email, Andrew. Um, oh, all right. Because I, I should read something here. <laughs> <laughs> if you just want to double check. But I think, I think this is pretty solid. All right. There's a lot on there. Oh, it's our buddy head. You when you said I have something, it's probably from our buddy James Harrison, who's <laughs> you know, basically our unofficial partner of the show. Yeah. Alrighty. 
Yeah, and if we can kind of not not go too too long, so these guys can get okay. a break between. Oh, that's right. We got. Cool. Uh, okay. Well then. Uh, Happy hour at the top of the hour. Yeah. All right. Uh, the next top of the hour. Yeah. Um, all right. Then I'll uh, catch you in for after things. Okay. We're going in three, two. Hello and welcome to the After Things podcast. I'm Andrew Main, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, folks. Justin Robert Young. Hello, hello. And Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hey, everybody. Well, our favorite thing to do here is to actually answer questions. And one of our favorite people to get questions from is Mr. James Harrison. And <laughs> Mainly James because he Ru actually listens to our advice. It, it, it's, yeah. it's astonishing how excited we are to talk to people who will actually listen to us. Yeah. As we established in the prior show, though, sometimes listening to my advice is the wrong thing to do. So <laughs> James writes, hello, fellow Fallout cosplayers. I guess that's oh, a oh, oh, game. because we're in the apocalypse, apocalypse right now. Yeah, it's an apocalypse. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If it makes you feel better, I walked right past a Fallout reference in uh, the most recent Modern Rogue video. Uh, like there was a bunch of bottle caps put in my quarantine bag, and I was like, "What's this a reference to?" And I was like, God "Your, damn it, I'm your so initial dumb. thought was, oh, because I throw bottle caps at people. Yes. I think I've never seen you do before." <laughs> well, it, it, was, it was. It was. What's funny is it's Brant that keeps that alive. Like he will occasionally, mm -hmm. I'll hear the jingling, and then last minute, too late, he'll throw bottle caps at me, and I realized <laughs> that he's still playing my game from five years ago uh he writes so since we have time to work on projects i thought i would try an idea i had nothing too original developing a podcast but as an experiment if you didn't have the budget to buy the software or the equipment microphones tons of external drives computers just a tablet and a phone and the idea was to interview people how would you go about doing this Remember, just an experiment to see what you folks would do. In no way am I limiting you because all I have to work with is an iPad Pro and an iPhone XR. Just an experiment, nothing else. James Harrison, really, guys, just an experiment. We're just experimenting here. Also, also okay. don't, 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 don't mind that muffled scream in the corner. Just an experiment. It's just experiment. an experiment, man. <laughs> have you guys um, done any mo just Justin, you've de certainly done a lot of remote interviewing with, uh, with the politics stuff. Uh, You know... I, so I had a, a device that was much better at recording audio, like room audio. Uh, but then I would always, I got more comfortable with like, I had missed a few things enough times that I realized like, you know, perfect is the enemy of good. And I would much rather always whip out my phone and hit record, uh, than, think about whether or not this is worthy of me getting my equipment out and putting the thing together and hitting record. Uh, so that being said, like a lot of the stuff that I got, like I mixed it in with the other, uh, the, the, a lot of the audio I captured off my phone, I mixed it in with audio from the other device and you could tell that it was different, but it wasn't so bad that it didn't belong on the podcast. Like I would use that audio uh, going forward. It, if I were, especially since you you get the coupon of, uh, uh, you know, putting a hat on it on the podcast of saying, "Hey, we were live. We were at this place. That's why it's going to sound a little weird." And let's go. Like the moment somebody says that, I forgive whatever terrible audio follows. Yeah. So it's like, for an example, I was in Nevada and I was at like a Bernie fundraiser and I was able to sit down and do an interview at, at the beginning with all the good equipment. Right. But to give ambiance to everything, I had the speakers that were up on stage uh, uh, before and afterward. So I came out of, you know, in, into the segment with iPhone audio faded into a, a, an interview with the better equipment and then came out of it with uh, the people that were also speaking. And I don't think that it necessarily reacted in a way that wasn't just like, oh, well, yeah, this is in the field and this is sat down, uh, you know. So this is all to say, I think depending on what your interviews are about and where you're conducting them, uh, you can probably get away with it. You could probably, uh, I don't know if this falls into our, you know, Apollo 13 use only what's on board kind of scenario, but if you have earbuds or if you have, 
uh, uh, any kind of microphone that would probably help it uh, help produce a little bit of the echoey sound that would happen if you were doing things indoors. In fact, I'd probably suggest that you do them outdoors. Um, but then past that, getting the audio onto the uh, iPad Pro and editing it there, I think I'm pretty sure that you have Adobe Audition on iPad Pros. Like, and if not, you certainly have uh, a stuff that you could cut stuff down but i mean like you could theoretically have the same interface that i'm using here on my computer uh on on an ipad pro so like i think that in terms of editing i don't know exactly how functional it is because i've never used it but if you could get over that then like yeah with a, a purchase and a subscription you could be rocking and rolling yeah, to capture the audio, I was going to say that's the key. I don't know if he's actually going to be going out and interviewing people in this situation. I think he might be trying to do it over the phone and stuff. So there is software. I'm looking at there's Tape -A Call Pro, which is, I think, like 11 bucks, whatever, which will let you record an interview with somebody on the phone, which you could then take that and then put that into what Justin was talking about, some of the, the audio tools for editing. So I would take a look at Tape -A Call Pro. Anchor lets you record your audio and then have people call in and then you can just insert that. Yeah, that so, was that was going to be the one I recommend is Anchor, Anchor.fm, because it, keeping with his... Oh, you uh, can co-host now. Oh, sweet. Right, cool. so people who have the app can call in and treat it like a phone. Hey, I'm on the phone. We're all on our phones and we're calling in. And But everybody's it, recording separately? Is my understanding. Yeah. And then Anchor mm -hmm. has an editing suite and... You can to the point where Anchor, because Anchor is now owned by Spotify, and that they kind of want to be an all-in-one, like record it here, edit here, and then publish to our service, which is also free. Um, I think I have not I have not played with it because I've never needed either a mobile-first application or a completely free application, but I hear good things about it. And uh, if you know if we're talking about what you got on hand, what you got on hand is a very nice microphone in your phone and a free app yeah yeah i yeah I, I would think that there's an interesting there's an interesting world where you know if you did a few things to kind of like chrome polish some of the edges like you could actually do a really rad podcast mobile only at this point um uh, you know the some you know if, if you spent a touch of money on just a little bit of extra stuff you could really make it sing but i think even just on your phone you could make something that sounded pro uh this is a bit like that uh we were talking about how uh the triathlon is the perfect uh middle class white person uh, uh sport because you can actually buy improvement in your triathlon time however they will be incrementally smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller uh i'd say podcast is much the same thing uh, first and foremost, focus on targeting a niche that is unoccupied so that you have no competitors. You know, if, if, if a, a space is filled, figure out how you could subdivide and zig where somebody else zags. But absent that, you know, you can keep on spending infinite amounts of money to, uh, Zeno zero, get closer and closer, closer to perfection. Mm -hmm. And there are like, uh, there are apps that can help you do different audio production things. Like, like Justin was saying, th th I, I, I also think that there's a version of an audition for the phone. I'm not sure, but even uh, GarageBand, like I'm pretty sure you can just use GarageBand and that comes free with these iPhones and the iPads now. Um, or like we use, um, what is this backpack studio, Justin, for, for soundboards? Yeah. Yeah. You can record into that and it'll yep. record and you can hit, hit sounders and stuff. And it has some processing and sweetening stuff in there too. So, uh, and that was like, Ten, five or ten bucks, but it's like an unlimited thing, and that has like a bunch of other feet, like ice cast fe features and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a lot of really, really, really cool stuff out there. Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, I don't know if as a workflow it's something sustainable enough that you'd be really excited to do it, and that ultimately is kind of the choke point of any podcast is like if you want to do something specifically weekly boy do you have to have a workflow that at least on a minimum you are you get confident in right let alone one that's easy to use and that you can go forward with with uh you know and, and enjoy it uh so i don't know if if it's quite there i suspect it might not be because we don't see more of it yet 
but that's not to say that the product isn't possible. Yeah. And I think with Anchor now having Spotify money and wanting to be a, the big platform that everyone goes and starts stuff with because it is like, I think that's free. a great space for them. Yeah. Anchor has always been a better technology than it is a social network. And that was, I think, the reason why uh, it, it kind of failed to get adoption before. If you think of it more as a recording app, um, and and using some of the cool things that they can do in terms of like quote unquote call ins and stuff like that, uh, then that's then that's good. And it also takes away part of the worries of any kind of podcast startup that offers free hosting is that it's a startup. Startups go away, and now all of a sudden, are you having to figure out a way to get your podcast off their service? That, but now that they're Spotified up, like I think that 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 gives you a lot more like Spotify is spending a ton of money on podcasting. They are not going to be out of the podcasting game anytime soon. So uh, yeah. I think you, you can reasonably feel safe. Yeah. Yeah. They, they, they want the content cause they've already got, you know, they figured out their advertising model, et cetera. And that was a, I remember when anchor, when they launched and then they talked about like, they had like the Q and a like, Oh, it's free. Like, yeah, like we just got some VC money so we can pay for this. I'm like, I don't think that's a good business model guys. And then they got bought yeah. by Spotify again. I was wrong. Again, <laughs> yeah. again. Uh, I'm smelling a theme. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it's, it's really interesting because I think anchor, uh, like I feel like we saw with music publishing, um, low cost services like the one the one that I subscribe to and use for my music is DistroKid, and they're great because it's a yearly fee. They don't charge you like per release. It's just it's a set price and use it as much as you want. And I think Anchor can be a similar force in trying to push hosting providers into offering much cheaper, if not free, hosting options, uh, as well as opening up ad marketplaces to creators because that's the other thing Anchor will do is you can give it. You can put your your put your program in their ad marketplace, and I don't know if it's dynamic ads or if they're just baked in or or, or what. Uh, but giving people any option, good or bad, like is more than any any other free service would give you. So I th I think both of those are going to be big things you see, not just from Anchor, but ripple out to others like Podbean or Libsyn or uh, 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 Firesider or whoever, as they have to compete with that. Uh, hey, can I can I give a quick tip of the hat to a, a practice that that we don't engage in very often, but I was reminded yesterday has a lot of value. Um, Bryce and I recently had a lot of homework uh, handed uh, to us where it's like mm. there's a bunch of black and white. These must be done to do's, um, you know, call it, you know, I don't know, dozens of items where it's like, you know, you suddenly have all of this homework and. The obvious thing was for us to, well, get started. Let's let's start doing them. But weirdly, yesterday afternoon, we had a meeting and we didn't do any of them. And yet I feel like we got a lot farther forward than if we had just started knocking out those to-do items. Sure. I, I think uh, to, to maybe give a little more context, normally we're talking about a project where we would shoot stuff. And a lot of times we go into that on the day of the shoot and say, what are the things that you've got? And then we talk about them and then we see what we like and what order and all. Um, and instead we just spent an hour or so coming up with the idea list for something that would last us months, if not more. Yeah. And, and, without and I guess shooting a, a another, another way to, to, to restate it is like, these were all bite-sized uh, uh, shoot segments that were small enough that it would be tempting to just pack man them up. Like, like, well, let's get started. Da, 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 got that done. But instead yeah. somehow by spending like two or three hours just saying, Hey, uh, I'm going to go to bed anxious tonight, unless <laughs> I at least know that we have enough in the tank to make it through all of these bite-sized uh, chunks that we have to do. Right. And then we started sketching everything out and suddenly you find yourself thinking about like uh, bigger messaging, bigger ideas. And then, and then you, you discover like kind of big branches that, that splinter off into individual segments and you realize, Oh wait, there's really three big ideas we're going to cover. And, and these are the themes that it breaks down to. And then, what, what's funny is we started listing all the individual pieces and at some point we kind of got bored of it where it's like, yeah, yeah, we got plenty. Uh, let's, let's stop talking about that and go back to the big idea stuff. So I, I guess, uh, I guess what I'm bringing up is the idea of uh, counterintuitively. Sometimes it really does make sense to 
not do the thing you have to do, the concrete black and white thing, but instead to take a few step backs and, and, and think like, what do we have? What are they asking for? You know, what, what might the future look like for, for a bunch of things? Well, I think, you know, JC Calhoun says like, so planning. And it's like, yes. And yes. And uh, <laughs> the, I mean, you know how, the, how the, we, if you don't know how we work around here, normally it's, we just, we do it and we see how it goes. And like this, the, the thing that we had, which is pre us even starting this project wouldn't happen until we're like a week or two into it. And we realize, okay, we've run out of stuff again. What is the next thing? And yes. then we have to be, we have to break a levy to have and, that meeting. Well, and and, and just, just, just to, just to, to, you know, finish my point here. Oh, yes, uh, yes, sorry. The, the idea isn't that, Oh, this is planning. Yes, it is. But the problem that happens in any workflow is that you allot yourself the time you need to plan. Right, it's not like they weren't planning to do modern rogue stuff in in the old format. There's just every once in a while, uh, I think it is smart to just break that workflow and whatever needs more attention, just giving that like mega dose of all right. Everybody only think of this one thing, or inside your own head, like only think of this one thing. It, it can just kind of do wonders. And and I found myself in this position last week with the politics show where uh, like I was just tired of trying to pretend to be a virologist, right? Like the, 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 the way that we've talked about politics is different. And uh, it, 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 I think it was weighing on not only me, but the audience in terms of just repeating COVID case numbers and uh, uh, things that kind of become stale. So I just, like now that's not to say that I wasn't planning every episode going like in the past I was, it just like, I had not spent a ton of time just thinking of, all right, thematic evergreen content. Like where, where does that take me? And it's already kind of altered the show in the two episodes that I've done since they're literally just blue sky brainstorming things and ideas and some of the ideas were good some of them are going to be segments that i'll go forward and do but in general just taking like all right let me let's just adjust our lens a little bit it makes you think oh i have a lens and i i it was trained on this one thing but like i can broaden the spectrum and i realize now like oh why was i feeling and bound in it was because i had a very very tight lens because that was what the election was going to be is razor focused on both candidates and now that the action isn't there and i need more stuff for for the record jc calhoun is not wrong to ding us on you know planning being a novelty i think it's fair to say that sort of baked into some of the dna has been that we prioritize uh, agility over planning because planning you have the possibility to invest dozens of hours into a thing that suddenly is not relevant at all. Whereas investing in agility, uh, as you see, you know, the closer you get to that deadline, then you pivot and jump and maybe it's not the highest fidelity and maybe it's not as deep as you would like. Uh, Some of that you could correct in the edit afterwards. Some of it you can't. Um, I I understand the trade-off on that, but, but uh, I think as a business entity, would it, would it be fair to say that we've prioritized agility over, over planning? Sure. And, and I think, I think Justin made a, a good point on, on JC Calhoun's comment and we're not, this is not railing. Um, it, I, it's not planning, it's brainstorming. I mean, we, there is planning that goes into everything that gets done to a certain degree. This was like idea dump, no bad ideas, brainstorming. And but I think the, there is a, there is a, a distinction between those two. Play, playing a little bit of a game of, uh, it seemed like back and forth, there was a lot of what ifing and then what would we do if, and then, uh, and, and having that safe space of like, we're not saying this is going to happen. We're not saying this goes right. Yeah. You know, for, for example, uh, right now, uh, I think we're close enough to the end of this broadcast that I can say it out loud. Uh, we're actually broadcasting this uh, using two different completely independent in, uh, internet connections because we're trying to think in advance, like, okay, if we get this big live contract, what happens if the internet goes out? We don't have a backup. And so we're actually learning to use all of that stuff. But, but the freedom to be in a space of like, let's blue sky and talk about all the possibilities you know, what if everything craps the bed? What what would we do then? Uh, but and, to and, do do that in a way that's not accusatory or whatever. And, and to kind of parallel I've been working. Uh, so one one last thing to kind of parallel this net, this network thing to the brainstorming thing is like 
we have had this idea to do it this way for a little while now, but kind of the only time we kind of talk or say like, should we do it is right before the show starts and we have like five minutes or we're already live and there's no time to do it. So when it's the day before and we can say, okay, let's decide to do this and we right. can set aside 10 or 15 minutes beforehand, like that, uh, that is preparation, you know, um, that you give yourself that space. Uh, I, I'd love to get my take on this is that I've been doing this because I've, I've been involved in a project where I spent the last prior month, two months doing a lot of things agile, like building things, building things, building things, building things, and then showing them and getting, getting, oh, this is cool, this is cool, this is cool. And now I'm in the position where I have to put all of this together. And my instincts were like, great, I'll just take everything I've already done before, put it together, fix everything, tweak things. And I said, no, step back, look at all the things you made, take these things apart. Now, instead of just planning on based on what I did before, the step back, go look at the whole thing and say, okay, what do I really need here? Do I need to just keep doing the same thing over and over again or you know, trying to patch all it together? Or do I wanna go take a step back and say, okay, this is the smarter approach. Even though my energy is just to drive right through and to take the thing I made before, it's like, no, let's stick back, take it apart a little bit, it needs to be. And even though that's gonna add a week to what I was planning on doing, I know in the past, if I just rush right into it, I have to go redo it. And like with your segments and stuff, if you ran through and you just did sort of the way you did before, you'd get them done. But then you're like, oh man, if we'd stopped and we looked at this thing from the outside or Justin talked about stepping back and looking at it through that different lens, then you say, oh, this is the pattern. This is the pattern that underlies everything. And now that I know this, my yeah, life is a lot easier. I suppose what I'm tipping my hat to is the fact that we could have, let's say, shot one third of all the things we had to shoot yesterday. We could have hit the ground running and just shot, 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 shot. Yeah. When we went to bed, we would not sleep as Never. well as, uh, sorry, <laughs> that <laughs> night as each of us went to our individual sure. houses and went to <laughs> right. bed. Uh, even though we would be one third closer to uh, being finished, none of us would have slept as well as I think we slept last night separately. Separately, uh, different places. To, to, uh, because we we at least saw the ending before we even began, and and I think that's something that as a uh, institutional body uh, that that we should note and and really lock in our mind. Mm -hmm. I think there's also a, a lesson to be learned here about knowing this is a second level problem you need to know that you have a process uh, or this is partially you understanding the form and function of your process so you can now do maintenance on it. And that takes a lot, you know, because a lot of these, uh, especially, you know, uh, uh, you guys, uh, it, you know, with, with Modern Rogue, you got a staff and everything, but for a lot of folks that we're talking to, it's a one-man band operation. And it's hard to realize because the the – the beginning of anything is survival. Literally, you are just trying to keep this baby alive. And that means that things have to happen and you can learn more from watching them afterward. And it's only once you've kind of proven like, Oh, okay, this is a thing. It brings in X amount of money or it brings in X amount of views. Now let me take a look at not just what can I learn from the last thing I did, but now what can I learn if I really thought about the next things I'm doing that the you're going to, you're going to have a, a good time. And, and with this project in particular, or again, without getting into too, too many details, though, I guess people will eventually find out soon enough. Uh, it's a sort of thing where, you know, like I said, it's a lot of segments. So it's, it's a lot of, sh it's a lot of shorter bits. And so even if we did go and film a third of that, uh, even if we were out there just filming the whole time, it we would have kind of constantly had to start and stop and figure out what are we, what what are the things, what are we doing, what are we trying, and then if we filmed something and we thought, oh, you know, actually we should do less of these, like uh, it it's it it was it was good to kind of get a feel for for the space because neck because when we go and film stuff to, tomorrow, uh, we will have a pool that we all that will be less friction because we kind of all agree that this is where we're starting from. We, we, we basically set up the buffet for future us's to pick from knowing that, that, that future us's will wander in hungry, hungry and irritable and just wanting to grab whatever is easiest. Uh, thankfully we did, we did the, the, the hard work of like, well, here's, here's the first, you know, however many to pick from. Yeah. So brainstorming picks, picks, picks. Um, I, will 
tip my hat to a book I mentioned before, uh, un -F word yourself. Uh, I, I forwarded it on to your friend of mine, Andrew Heaton. Uh, the book is essentially a treatise on stoicism, talks about the importance of replacing negative self-talk with productive self-talk, which does not mean that you convince yourself that the world is filled with rainbows and unicorns, but instead you frame things in a very concrete way that uh, allow you and empower you to make uh, smarter decisions. And um, uh, Andrew and I were chatting the other day and I found out he hadn't heard of it. Of course, uh, Andrew is a full-on uh, Scottish fetishist. Uh, he, he loves Scotland <laughs> more than anything. So I sent him a book where a Scottish man explains stoicism. And so far he seems to like it. Not pretty cool. Uh, I, I continue to watch community. It continues to be good. Second season halfway through just saw the claymation episode. It's a good time. Oh, nice. Uh, I just started this morning and I think I'm going to keep up with it. The new, uh, Justin Roiland and Mac, uh, McMahon, uh, Hulu show solar opposites. Um, man, it's, this thing sounds a lot like Rick and Morty. Um, <laughs> Uh, Justin Roiland plays one so it's basically kind of a almost like an immigrant story these these aliens escaping their uh blown up planet land on earth uh and are assimilating into earth life while uh working on the mission and uh they do they do uh you know they they have stories and I think that there's a little bit of a serialized thing but it's all on Hulu and they dropped the whole first season I think what was really interesting comparing it to Rick and Morty because I mean even like the text treatment for the opening credits is like the same font <laughs> for Rick and Morty. You hear the, the the music over the end credits and it's like, it really sounds like a sound alike to the Rick and Morty opening song, you know? Um, but I think what is really different is tonally. Um, this is partly produced by 20th Century Fox. And I don't know if that's just because it's a Hulu and Disney thing or what, but it definitely feels like something that would have been in the Sunday Fox animation uh, lineup, you know, sure. uh, prime time, gotcha. you know, adult animation. And this one is very adult. Uh, there's curse words and stuff. And uh, and so it feels it feels it's both a little happier or it's not as depressed as as Rick and Morty. Um, but it also just feels it, it feels a little more like we are accomplishing story. We are accomplishing prime time stories here. Um, I think it's really fun and, and really inventive, and I'm really excited to see the other seven episodes that are out there. Uh, it's, it, seems, it seems really, really good. I watched the first one, and I enjoyed it, and, and it is so much that, like, how much of Rick and Morty is really Royland and Royland's choices and stuff, and I think Harmon certainly brings in a lot of the story structure and stuff to it, but how much really is Royland? Because when you look at everything Royland does on his own, of from the design and the voices and sort of the sensibility yeah. and stuff is you really, you really, you, this is an example, like you pick that and you look at like what he does with Squanch Co and some of the other stuff, you know, you just see you know, Royland's voice well, surrounds out. And, and Mike McMahon, the, the co-creator on this was a showrunner on Rick and Morty too. Yeah. And had written for Rick and Morty. So you see, you, you see a lot of that same stuff there too. Uh, someone sent me along an interview that they did with um, Decider or something um, talking about, and they are very openly like, yeah, it wasn't a function of like trying to differentiate it from Rick and Morty. The fact that Rick is not a character who is so central to Rick and Morty means that it is inherently a different thing. He is so central to yeah. that plot and brings so much of the emotional and tonal direction that by not having him and having other characters and other char archetypes, like it may look the same and the skin might look the same. I mean, they even had a little asterisk uh, pupil eyes that, that Rick and Morty characters have. Uh, it, it feels very different. And it's funny. Like, it's just, it's really funny, I, you know? I got to get past the first episode because the, the head alien is very Rick-like. He's very Rick. He's very... But he's also, like, kind of... Like, he's smart. He's like a big science guy. But he's also... There's a lot of naivete, I guess, that, that yeah, yeah. Uh, is no, a kind of central thing. Yeah. But yeah, I enjoyed it. I'll watch the other ones. Solar opposites. Uh, my pick is, and I've just started this, but I'm going to pick it because he's a friend and I'm biased, but that is Matt Ridley's How Innovation Works. Ooh. Nice. And is this, this is his is new this book. new new or like, like, like weeks new? Well, it comes out on May 19th. Okay, but okay. So, so it's new. Uh, All right. I, I, not just as late. I guess I was thinking of the evolution of ideas. Uh, oh, 
that out. This brand new. Well, who's his name in the acknowledgments? Oh, all right, I get into all that. right. <laughs> uh, yeah. So this is a book talking about basically the, his Matt's thoughts on how innovation works, etc. You know, basically where ideas come from, how it works, and just how in free societies it flows, and we have these things come through and just continue to develop. A lot of great stories, and just you know, Matt just is. If you haven't been reading Matt Ridley, your life is probably you know, 1% of what your life could be, to be honest with you. Um, uh, uh, his origin of virtue is one of my favorite things ever that really affected me. And, uh, you know, to, to later on get to be able to talk to that guy in person was just like, ah, amazing. So anyhow, uh, Matt Ridley, how innovation works is I actually read more of it. I'll have more to talk, but nice. he has been working on this book for a long time. Long cool. Time, so. cool. Gentlemen, it's been after. Woo! Hey, everybody, good stuff. It was good. It was a fun one. Yeah, good stuff today. We're gonna. Uh... So, can we can we reveal now? Are are we close enough to landing this that we can tell everyone yeah. what we've been up to? Yeah. If 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 uh, somehow they still couldn't put it together. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah why don't you do that while I get? Uh, yeah. No. So I went to the AT and T store and got a SIM card for uh, for the iPad. So we ran video on the uh, LTE. Uh, uh, which I found out that the, so AT&T has quote unquote unlimited packages, but as you know, at some point they start throttling. But what I found out that I did not know is that they measure like that throttling threshold is not per account, it is per device. So a single device can cross the threshold and then other devices still get, you know, full speed ahead. Or specifically per line. Uh, yes, yes, sorry, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, Today we added a sixth device to my family uh, that is entirely going to sit here and just be a freaking oh shit switch to, to pull yeah. that uh, that seems to have run fine during this so far. You know, uh, I mean, we had a 5% drop rate, which is... Not perfect. It's not perfect, but it did seem like when it had... And I'll have to check the Twitch Inspector. I have not been having a good experience getting the Twitch Inspector to load. Um, but it seemed like when we had drops, they were small. Uh, and they were short, and they kind of ironed themselves over relatively quickly. Yeah, I was watching here on my end, and, like, there were some, like, hiccups, but uh, nothing that totally derailed the show, and uh, there was no complaints. So, usually, and also the, normally, this is the real sign of success. The uh, audience went up. <laughs> normally, when there are tech problems that are distracting, the audience goes down. Yeah, uh, someone so, nailed uh, it. In the year of our Lord, COVID-19, LTE became more reliable than a hard line. True facts. And the other thing is... Crazy. Uh, some of the speeds, the ups and downs that we'd kind of seen with the uh, phone testing, we were not getting. Oh, that's great. With this. No. That's great. Or no, bad. We're, oh, we're, wait. We were getting worse. Like, you know how... You... Oh, slower speeds? Yeah. I wonder if that's placement, because we have it sort of like leaning on a switch right now. <laughs> Maybe. I don't, I don't know. But... Uh, it certainly wasn't the what a hundred meg up you were getting you get on your phone. We no, getting, I I don't think I quite get a hundred meg up. We were getting in the ten to twenty. Uh, that's that's about what I was what I would lean on. Yeah. What I would reliably say All we right. could. Do. Yeah. Okay. We got to turn the thing off. But yep. uh, thank you for listening. Thank you guys. They'll be back with the happy hour in about thirty minutes. Ba -ba 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 -bye. Uh, at Andrew Main, at Break Breakus, at Justin R Young, at Shwood. Bye. 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 Bye.